Yeah. And you know that that's that's the interesting thing because I remember um, recently when you emailed me and you sent me um, give me a halter and um, I forgot exactly what you said but you said something oh this is a pretty uh, extreme one or something like that and I'm like okay then I listened to it I'm like oh yeah this is gonna be a good music video <laughs> and so when you posted uh, the backstory to some of the the Mondo Vanilli. I, I got really interested to to you know um, I got really interested in the backstory, and I think it was on uh, Twitter in in an exchange uh, something about oh if the the Reddit kids started to decode uh, Mondo Vanilli um, what would happen then? Typically, it's a uh, Mondo two thousand predicted the future, but um, I think it's a Mondo Vanilli um, really tapped into something that like reverberated into the the future that we are in now i think <laughs> yeah. but all right well let's uh let's get rolling yes for sure so millie vanilli i think starting there and um you started to form the idea of mondo vanilli yeah so uh this was a period when mondo 2000 was really tapped into virtual reality and the idea of life in the simulacrum and uh blurred lines the blurred distinctions between the real and the uh, virtual the real and the fake something that's really coming into play now in disturbing ways in some ways uh, with uh, with ai in the year 455 the planet earth begins jettisoning raw sewage into outer space ai uh, being able to uh, throw up instances of uh, individuals who will look and sound like themselves but uh, are actually puppets for another person or an AI system. But anyway, back then, Millie Vanilli was being given some kind of award or had been given some kind of award. They'd performed at the Grammys and it was revealed that uh, they didn't really sing their songs and that they were lip syncing. And, uh, you know, my, my thought in that via virtual reality saturated moment was so what why make a fuss about lip syncing and i you know number number one that it was absurd that this awful recording won an award is level of mediocrity that uh is hard to fathom um but <laughs> but that's what the grammys were about and to a, to a large extent have been a gr- about for a long time uh, really preposterous uh products of the music industry uh, sharing sharing space with the with the Beatles or Aretha Franklin or Bob Dylan or whatever Nat- the nature of the music industry itself so anyway uh, popped into my head at that moment to create a virtual reality band uh, that would be called the Mondo Benelli obviously after Mondo 2000 the uh, woman who I was with at the time I was sitting at a uh, coffee shop she hated it because it didn't sound cool and sexy but Anyway, that's that's what we uh, that's what I went with. I had worked with Dave Fleminger, uh, who uh, we now call Scrappy Duchamp, earlier uh, on a project called uh, the Merry Tweaksters. And we did uh, some songs uh, slated for uh, an event in 1987, the Harmonic Convergence. Okay, yeah. We didn't particularly believe in, but uh, we mm-hmm. thought it would be fun to uh, put out something in that moment uh so i wrote a song called mary tweakster world mutation day and it's never going to be the same and uh it was it was patterned after sergeant pepper's lonely hearts club band and uh i wrote another song called sufi sales s-u-f-i sales uh which was patterned after i get by with a little help from my friends and we were moving on with the idea of, of creating a whole album patterned after uh, Sergeant Pepper's under the working title, Sergeant Peckerhead. Uh, <laughs> but we, we never got very far into it. There was one song called The President of Outer Space, mm-hmm. which I th- should exist somewhere. It got recorded. Even got It even got used in a live Mondo Vanilli uh, appearance, but it seems to have disappeared into the ether. Wow. But uh, that was going to be uh, in the place of Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. And you did was that you guys recorded those two songs and you were going to put it in, or did you put it in High Frontiers? 
And you got like. Yeah, we were going to put it as a uh, one of those flexi discs uh -huh. uh, things that they used to put in magazines in uh, High Frontiers. But uh, yeah, it was, it was not a, it was not an affordable. <laughs> that it was... One, one oh, yeah. peculiar aspect of this was that uh, we finished the recording. We thought it was pretty good. We brought it to uh, a friend of ours at the Pacific Station in Berkeley, mm -hmm. uh, APFA, and he couldn't play it because it had the word piss in it. <laughs> it's, it seems so bizarre now, but uh, it was one of the seven words that uh, George Carlin uh, created a routine around. Mm -hmm. And then, so when you started to bring together the concept of Amando Vanilli, there was something about like um, the virtu virtual virtual band, a digital Chuck E. Cheese animatronic thing, and like these uh, performances that you guys were doing <laughs> that were pretty crazy. Um, and even, I think too, uh, I guess getting to when you get your demo tape at the Trek Reznor party. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, um, where do we start? Um, we didn't do very many performances, actually. Okay. Uh -huh. um, there's, a, there's a famous performance, semi-famous, infamous performance uh, <laughs> performed at an art space. It was really a Sim 1 three-arm performance with uh, all the Mondo Vanilli members participating. Um, but um, he had me in a, uh, a baby's crib. Yeah. The spikes pointed inward, me <laughs> and I was in diapers with chocolate <laughs> all over myself. And uh, Gabby Duchamp was on some fake keyboards playing a, uh, a pre-recorded cassette tape of uh, of an audio collage, a very memorable uh, audio collage <laughs> with, the, with the theme "Send Me to Paradise." Every once in a while, <laughs> Sim One. Three arm was inserting uh, eggs into her vagina and uh, taking them out and uh, putting them into a bowl for people to uh, come and get. And <laughs> anyway, they uh, they so chose. Um, and apparently, I think it was called the Art Attack Gallery. I believe it almost got them shut down. <laughs> but actually, I think it was only because uh, she left the crib with the spikes pointed inward in the window. Somebody was uh, offended or upset by the spiky, uh, spiky crib. <laughs> I don't know why, uh, you know, child abuse should not be a subject dealt with by visual art. I have no idea, you know, what, what kind of person in San Francisco would have uh, created a fuss about that. But um, anyway, that's that's what happened there. There, there was some. Uh, it's hard for me to remember. Um, there was a a fairly large, well attended show at a performance space near the Castro, mm -hmm. and I remember that somebody got upset by that as well, and reported it to someone. But I can't I can't remember the details of it, and I'm not sure why that would have been so upsetting. Um, I do remember that. Uh, a uh, a woman who was a uh, a sex worker was really freaked out by the song I O U Babe. But, uh, she was on acid. No. Oh. Uh, but but she also thought it was an incredible statement, and you know that it was a, it was saying something on on her behalf. So uh, uh, that was interesting. Yeah. So I I guess we'll, we'll we come up to. Um... You doing the the demo tape, and then somehow you guys get it in the hands of Trent uh, Reznor at this uh, party at the the Tate uh, Manson mansion. Yeah, the, the old Tate Manson. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, we went down to Los Angeles, the three of us, with the intention of uh, bringing our tape around. What's the, what's the word I'm looking for? Demo, demo. Uh, around uh, to uh, various people in the music industry who we had connections with uh, through Monday 2000 um, and to see if anybody was interested in having us uh, record an album and signing us. And we had created this little fold over visual pamphlet that said, you may have already won. 
uh, <laughs> had uh, someone uh, pointing a gun at whomever was receiving it, and it it, uh, it was a, a disrespectful towards the music industry sort of little playful thing that tried to explain that uh, we were virtual and uh, that uh, we resented the uh, existence of rules, but and and we didn't believe it was correct for us to uh, record music, but we wanted to do it anyway for that reason. So we had that, um, and we got into L.A., and we met with a, a couple of people at some, some major agents there who showed a vague interest. And uh, we hooked up with a high-powered lawyer, Kara Burns, which is part of, uh, I think, Bernard, Burns, Manat, and Phillips. And they, like, represented, God knows, Michael Jackson, <laughs> and like, super top of the heap. Yeah. Uh, representation and and nobody but top of the heap representation but because uh, this woman was friends with uh, somebody who had come down to Los Angeles with us Yvonne uh, she agreed to take us on which probably was a mistake for us because it probably just led to concern and complications with uh, Rosner's little mini label when they were suddenly faced with with this serious representation on on our end, uh, but I'm jumping ahead a little bit. So anyway, there's a woman named uh, Casey Cannon, not to con- be confused with Christy Canyon, who is also an LA friend. Um, and Casey Cannon was a person who edited most of those little one to two minute teasers that you would see uh, for upcoming films when you went to the movie theater. Mm-hmm. to uh, see a film. I don't even know if they still show those anymore. I haven't been a, into a theater in, in that long. Um, but that that was her thing. She did most of those. Her husband, Van Ling, was the main person uh, working with James Cameron, uh, bringing new technology to his attention at every turn. Mm-hmm. So he, he was engaged and uh, they were engaged at that level. And Anyway, when we called Casey Cannon on the phone, she said that uh, she explained that Trent Redesner had uh, moved into the house, the old Tate mansion where yeah. uh, Sharon Tate had uh, been killed by uh, uh, the Manson girls. For some reason, uh, the song California Girls always pops into my head when I, whenever I mention them. So, uh, and, she, and she said that he was having a housewarming party that not very night. And we were staying with Timothy Leary, so that was a pretty good calling card to introduce ourselves to any uh, celebrities. Although Reznor was uh, aware of Monda 2000 and had been uh, featured in it and, you know, knew who I was and so forth. But anyway, we called uh, Pighead answered. Uh, Pighead, uh, who had been, what, in ministry, I think? And uh, uh, he... Christopherson, something like that. Anyway, yeah, great industrial music figure. Um, he answered, and he invited us to the to the party. So, uh, with Timothy Leary and all the Mondovanillians in, in tow, mm-hmm. uh, first Tim offered everybody some ecstasy, um, and or Sim One took it, and Yvonne took it, and uh, Scrappy and I refused. But then I uh, I snuck a half a hit just to get a light buzz. I, I guess I was too embarrassed to say, I'll just take a half. So <laughs> it was easier to refuse and then take the half. Um, in any case, off we went. On the way to the party, a, uh, somebody driving a, uh, I think it was a Corvette, some expensive sports car was uh, behind us. I think with Tim, I think we were driving an SUV actually, almost like a truck-sized car with Tim. Tim's okay. car, uh-huh. and the person behind us kept on trying to get in front of us. We kept on beeping the horn and waving his hand wildly. And somehow, I guess he eventually got in front of us and jumped out. And it was Gibby Haynes of the Butthole Surfers, <laughs> and he he screamed at us, "Do you know the way?" And he didn't have to say what the way was. It was you know we knew it was about going to Resner's party. Mm-hmm. And, um, then we got in front of him and we uh, led the uh, gang to uh, Reznor's party. Yeah, we arrived and there were 
two places there. There was a large, almost like a garage, or it was like a almost sort of like a warehouse space. And there were people standing around outside, and there was loud music coming from inside. And that seemed to be where the party was happening. And then there was a uh, smaller house where nothing seemed to be going on. So we went into the uh, into the party. Uh, Scrappy uh, Duchamp has a great uh, description in his discussion of this about the the pond that we saw on the way into yeah, the, the scummy pond. pond. Scummy pond that hadn't been cleaned in years. <laughs> great with that kind of observation, actually. I, I didn't notice that at all. Um, so anyway, we uh, we went into the party and it was kind of <clears throat> there's a lot of. Uh, Probably guys in their 30s drinking beer and uh, cute girls probably in their late teens and early 20s hanging out, kind of looking around. I think, you know, sadly uh, noticing that there weren't any rock stars there. <laughs> uh, so we kind of we kind of found our way to a place where we could sit down and it was pretty dull. It was like gloomy, uh, gloomy crop rock and people drinking beer out of uh out of uh you know a kegger kind of situation yeah. so uh, what happened was i think yvonne person who uh, had come with us who uh had many claims to fame uh among them being that she uh babysat for uh keith richards and anita pallenberg that's that's a, <laughs> <laughs> a pretty great claim to fame but she had her video camera with her and uh she uh Grabbed her video camera. We decided to go outside. She suggested we creepy crawly around the grounds. <laughs> it was a reference to uh, what the Manson girls did in the bushes at that uh, infamous lo location. Um, so we headed out there. On the way out there, there was Trent Reznor standing with, oh God, what's his name? The lead singer for the uh, Chili Peppers, Red Hot Chili Peppers. I can't think of his name. Anyway, people yeah. know him. I mean. So, and he said hi, and then Mr. Lead Singer said, your name is Are You Serious? <laughs> I, of course, knew what his name was, but I said, yeah, who are you? Uh, uh, Anthony Kiedis. And, yeah, and yeah. he shrank down to normal size and said, oh, my name's Anthony, and we shook hands. So we wandered around a little bit, and then uh, we started walking down to... Uh, the uh, other building, the, the small house. Mm -hmm. And I had a sign on the door that said, come in here if you want to be killed. And we could hear sound from inside and we opened the door and uh, went in and there was a sort of more, a smaller, more exclusive party going on in there with uh, Trent Reznor and Ketis and Butthole Surfer Gibby and a, a lot of really perfect looking Los Angeles groupie types and not i mean not a lot of rock stars that, that was it i think they were like music industry people i think in there so we went in and he, he, when people heard that i was from mondo 2000 they wanted to talk about virtual reality they wanted to learn more about virtual reality and i was kind of tripping out on how the person i was as a kind of street person freak in uh, a small town mm -hmm that person would have felt about being in the Sharon Tate house with Timothy Leary. Yeah. <laughs> kind of, kind of, uh, I was, I was flashing back to, uh, who I was, the, the nobody, <laughs> so called nobody who I was and freaking out on that. And people were wanting me to tell them about virtual reality. It was, it was like too much like every other party I'd been to, you know, it wasn't like, here's the, crazy Grant Reznor party yeah. at our Tate House. It was uh, people standing around talking and not really getting into much very interesting. At some point, I guess we must have hung out for a while. At some point, Reznor walked past me with a plastic bag full of uh, psilocybin mushrooms okay. and, uh, and a girl and smiled and winked and waved his baggie in the air and <laughs> went into a bedroom. <laughs> that's, pretty much, that's pretty much what I remember. Uh, Sim One had fashioned herself into a character she called the Cyberpiss Goddess of Annihilating Feces. Oh, yeah. 
which turned into a song for the uh, eventual IOU Babe album. So on the way out of the house, she decided to uh, take a magical piss uh, right on the edge of the property to uh, uh, cleanse it of the bad uh, Charlie Manson karma. Yeah, to undo the Manson curse. <laughs> yeah, cleanse it. I mean, I think Trent was after the Manson curse. I mean, he made the he made the downward spiral with songs like March of the Piggies and all that. Yeah. Uh, uh, so he was looking to that if if in, at least in some sense for inspiration and uh what the fuck man it was the 90s <laughs> it, it was uh crazier than now in a, in a lot of ways i mean it was it was loose crazy instead of anxious crazy so anyway yeah he uh he did that and what happened was we went back to tim's house what's his name uh uh gibby haynes came roaring in about half an hour later and he I think he was drunk and on acid and he came flying into the room he was like running and he ran up to uh, Timothy Leary and he, in that uh, kind of southern Austin Texas accent I asked Tim yeah, whatever happened to that good acid that you guys used to take back in the 1960s and uh, Tim said you know LSD is LSD it's just that they make the doses smaller now and then he said, yeah, but whatever happened to those great times when people used to hijack planes? And Tim Tim was offended by, by that. And he said, uh, you know, I don't think it's a good idea to hijack a plane. <laughs> and then Gibby didn't, I don't think Gibby really responded. I think he kind of, maybe he was on crack or something. He just started running around the house for a few minutes and went running back out the door again. <laughs> being friends actually although there are stories about him pissing in one of tim's closets or something like that oh, man. <laughs> at some point uh -huh. uh, a story told by al jorgensen not sure how reliable that would that would, that would be <laughs> uh, there's a period where jorgensen stayed with tim where uh, apparently uh, the wheels really came off <laughs> tim actually ended up calling uh Henry Rollins asking him to uh, come and get Gibby before he uh, overdoses and dies in, in Tim's house. And Henry Rollins, of course, being an anti-drug guy, always uh, has enjoyed telling the story about uh, the time uh, Leary called and asked uh, Henry to help him, help him out. <laughs> I don't remember if there was a result of that, if, if he did help him out. I think he did. I think he did maybe go and and uh, extract Gibby from uh, from the Leary house. Anyway, what happened was that night after the Reznor party, or after we left the Reznor party, yeah, the next morning we went back and uh, we left our uh, promotional kit and our cassette in uh, Reznor's mailbox. And uh, apparently Reznor picked it up or somebody picked it up right away. And uh, we got a call maybe maybe it was by the late afternoon or early evening that he really liked what we presented. Of course, he was still coming down from Magic Mushrooms. So I'm sure that helped, helped our case. And would we like to, uh, he was starting a new record label called Nothing and would we like to uh, be part of it? And so, yeah, right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so off we went to uh, meet with him again. And uh, let's see, this was in the evening. It might have been the same night or it might have been the night after. And it was just us and Tim and Reznor. He was there alone, as, as I remember, or at least he was the only person out and about. And uh, he very sh proudly showed us a Mellotron that I think he said John Lennon had owned or John Lennon had played. And uh, we kind of chatted, and, and that was the end of that. We were going to get a recording contract with Nothing Records. Nice. Um, and of course, there's much more to the to, to that story. Can and, we continue? Continue. Yeah. With that? And I and I think what's what what I find interesting of of uh, some of the, some of the story is like from there on. Um, I think they every time you had a meeting about the recording, there was a apocalyptic like overtone. Um, Oak, there was an Oakland fire, and then I think you're in LA, and there was like another fire. No, there was a riot. The LA the riots. riots. Yeah. Actually, this was pre Resner um, when we had a Mondo Vanilli meeting, and we were just beginning to record, sort of form a 
from a large gang around uh, Mondo Vanilli, a performance situation around Mondo Vanilli, and we're sitting on a hillside in San Francisco and the Oakland fire could be seen radically from from the distance. There's massive amounts of smoke going up in the air. Somehow we knew what was going on. I mean, nobody had cell phones back then. I'm not sure. What would that have been? Like 1991, I think. Mm -hmm. Hard to remember. It might have already... We might have already occurred, and we just had the meeting anyway in San Francisco, uh, because I remember I was in Berkeley getting up in the morning, and we were going to go. We actually had planned to go into a place in Oakland for breakfast, and uh, of course ended up not going. So the fire must have already been going. But uh, anyway, we were able to view that from a hillside in, in San Francisco. And then, yes, we had another uh, major uh, group meeting gathering uh, as the uh, L.A. riots were taking place. So, yeah, there was always an apocalyptic uh, context to uh, whatever Mondo Vanilli was was in the mix, for sure. (laughs) And uh, I guess the actual um, recording of the album, I read something about some visual sound representation of, like, a virtual control board or something? That was kind of interesting. Do you remember anything about that one? Huh. I'm not sure what you're referring to. There was a guy who used to hang out uh-huh. outside the studio, the Razor's Edge studio. Very, very popular studio, actually, where, uh, oh, I can't remember the name of all those alternative bands that recorded there. Kurt Cobain produced uh, a band there. It was the band of, I can't remember the name, uh, but... Uh, in quotes, Kurt Cobain produced in quotes. Mostly he uh, laid on the couch uh, sucking on nitrous oxide while high on oil. And while, uh, what's her name? Uh, Courtney. Uh, Courtney would come in and, and scream at him to get his shit together, which uh, I guess I can endorse. So anyway, yeah, that was a story there. Um, but it's always good to have a, a lot of gossip from, from that period. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, there was, I'm not sure what you were referring to about the sound system, but there was a guy who used to hang out outside the studio, the Razor's Head studio, Mm -hmm. a homeless guy, and he used to talk to himself. And uh, Jonathan Burnside, the owner and producer at at that studio, got a recording of him saying, you guys don't love us no more. Mm -hmm. I told you, man, it's something. I can't remember exactly, but it's in the, it's in the Gimme Helter song and apparently this guy was a uh, vietnam uh yeah this guy was a vietnam vet who uh you know was, was homeless yeah. uh, apparently not long after that he was uh he was shot and killed in a popeyes right down the street from burnside's uh studio so this uh, this whole thing it has a uh, strange set of associations and in his mind and in his memory. And of course, the thing is largely constructed of uh, samples taken from uh, Jim Jones Mm -hmm. screaming at his followers um, in Jonestown. So yeah, it was a pretty intense track. uh, Burnside said it was the most intense recording he ever he ever worked on but i think i think what you're talking about with the sound system was actually a live performance that okay. um, mondo vanilli did with sound traffic control not humans noise and performance group okay. in san francisco and i th- what happened was they went on before us and they broke the sound system pretty much mm-hmm. so that the sound was not great and we were doing something with pre-recorded music. Yeah. The uh, principle of Mondo Vanilli is that, that we shouldn't pretend that we're playing. So we had pre-recorded music and the performance uh, involved us doing stuff on stage uh, rather than actually uh, playing music on stage. As I recall, this one was not particularly uh, weird or grotesque. And I was strapped into a hospital gurney, and mm-hmm. Mom was up on a lifter, and I can't remember the intention or purpose or the reason for the visuals. There was some great video involved, and uh, um, everybody uh, hated it except for <laughs> Queen Moo and my uh, then 
girlfriend, Stara, both of whom were very impressed by it. But I actually think it was because they liked it because we used the song, uh, The President of Outer Space. Mm -hmm. uh, she creates, she ain't no fake, she's the dynamo, she's the earthquake. They probably both thought it was about them. <laughs> <laughs> I had written it a long time earlier, actually. But anyway, okay, uh, yeah, so where were we? Also, um, I guess back, any more stuff do you remember of the recording there at the Burnside studio? There was a lot of scrappy little little stories that I, I read about him kind of uh, figuring out how to how to do the, the music there. And I think even too earlier doing samples and, and you guys working through what, what, you, what your sound. I think also to what I like personally about the whole album is its range of of twists and turns of you're you're in a really heavy song or extreme song like give me halter and then then you could go to something that's like a 80s pop uh elevator music and then yeah yeah clones don't have to be so yeah. cold yeah i was just thinking about that, uh, that song in terms of how brief the lyrics were and that was that was something I I did at that point was I actually wrote really short snippets of lyrics for the Mondo Vanilli album. Mm -hmm. I didn't I, I didn't put a lot of you know if, if something popped into my head that I liked, I would put it down and I would I would say okay that's good enough. Mm -hmm. That's all we need. And I think I was thinking of David Bowie's role at time actually as a, something that could legitimize that approach to uh, writing uh, really short songs and uh, building building music around uh, the fragments of thoughts and ideas. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, what, in, in terms of how we evolved the music, I mean, Scrappy worked in conventional pop and rock music up to that point. Mm -hmm. Incredibly talented and skilled at, at creating uh, music to, to order. He actually has made a, a living uh, making music to order, I think, for games and uh, for all kinds of stuff. But uh, yeah, he was. I, w I was talking to a friend of his before I knew him and saying I wanted to uh, get some music made to some lyrics that I'd written. And he mentioned that he had a friend who, if you told him write a song that's a mix of Kate Bush and the Jimi Hendrix experience. Mm -hmm. He would sit down and, and make it, and it would be perfect, and it would be exactly what you would imagine if somebody had attempted to do that. And so I met him, and, and we did the pop stuff, the uh, Beatlesque stuff mm -hmm. first. And uh, then with the advent of uh, Mondo 2000 and the orientation towards uh, towards uh, virtual reality and the orientation towards uh, electronica and uh, towards uh, industrial music that uh, was part of the techno culture at that time. I told him that we should do something in this vein. And so he got a bunch of stuff and he disliked pretty much all of it <laughs> and felt that this was an excellent place to, to start from, to work with this material that he didn't experience much fondness for and i thought it, it did turn out that way it did turn out a, an interesting way of uh forcing a uh, sensibility such as his which probably is somewhere at the intersection of david bowie brian wilson and frank zappa mm -hmm. uh, Beatles, and you know forcing that into uh hard-edged uh, electronic music and you know, and there's an electronic dance track in there that's actually really well done. And Jonathan Burnside deserves some of the credit for all that as well. But uh, yeah, the, we had uh, uh, Love is the Product, and then we have mm -hmm. Love, the Remix, which is a, a great, a great little uh, kind of uh, electronica rave, rave rhythm kind of uh, piece. So, so yeah, I mean, that the, the mix was... Uh, came from the eclecticism of, uh, of Scrappy, really, and, and from what, what I wanted. And, you know, he, would, he, he learned uh, all the stuff, all the sampling, uh, audio synthesizer, all the different tools, Pro Tools, mm -hmm. all of it uh, he learned as soon as we started talking about uh, making Mondo Vanilli a recording 
and uh, he did some of the stuff at home and brought it into the studio and then he did some of the stuff at the studio itself and uh, uh, then he also ultimately brought some stuff home to do a final mix um, and slowly but surely uh, as the uh, record company produced some money for us that money uh, went into uh, making a great studio for him actually yeah and then so you guys finished the album and Trent Reznor kind of like listens to it and um, kind of puts it on the shelf, right? And doesn't release it. And- yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, what happened there was, uh, there was complications. All right. So nothing records. Uh-huh. He, was, he was given a boutique, basically a boutique record company as an enticement to sign with Interscope. Uh, and nothing records was, and he called it nothing records. No, nothing records was like Warner Brothers was, a, or Interscope was a subsidiary of Warner Brothers. And nothing was an was a subsidiary of Interscope. Although I think he believed that he had free reign and had money to spend. What happened essentially was he went way over budget on his own stuff, and uh, people who uh, he signed also went somewhat over budget on their stuff. I believe, including Marilyn Manson. And then also Interscope got in trouble with uh, the hearings the Tipper Gore hearings about music. Um, I believe they had uh, the guy who did The Chronic, um, Dr. Dre. They had the Dr. Dre album out. It was fresh at that time uh, when the the Tipper Gore gang was uh, in operation. Also, one of the things that came up in the hearing were objections to uh, Nine Inch Nails. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. Nine Inch Nails being played on the radio. Uh, and I mean, actually, uh, I did hear uh, Closer played naked. You know, I want to fuck you like an animal on uh, the San Francisco FM station once. <laughs> then again, I heard uh, George Jackson by Bob Dylan. He wouldn't take shit from no one played on a Binghamton radio station in 1971. So I guess you never know. Yeah. Once in a while, someone will sneak something in and then... <laughs> So, uh, so all that kind of pressure was was on Resner on his record company, and then we had our hardline lawyers, you know, our, our uh, high-powered lawyers, looking at a record contract that uh, Resner had originally intended to be artist-friendly, mm-hmm. and that eventually, I guess, ended up under the control of Warner Brothers which was described by our legal team as being the uh, a typically draconian contract uh, that they would sign with a with a new band that uh, that was not a sure bet so all of that factored into we never did get a contract all of that factored into no. uh, him not releasing the contract also he uh, just loved his dog he had a big dog I can't remember the kind of dog it was, I think it was a husky maybe or something mm-hmm. uh, but that hu- that dog went everywhere with him including to bed and the do- as I remember the dog accidentally like just went right over a cliff while they were on the road or oh, anyway it died horribly yeah he was in a bad state I mean he was in a downward spiral anyway yeah uh, I guess there were a lot of a lot of bad drugs going on for for him at that time and what i the only feedback we ever got back on the uh album itself was that we thought some of the songs were good mm-hmm. but we never really got uh, uh a read on uh, which ones <laughs> and i i i thought the whole thing was a concept album it's a concept album yeah really can't pull one part out of it with uh without it collapsing but mm-hmm. um Anyway, uh, so then I believe his management wanted to let us out of the contract easy, but the record company co- wanted to be paid back the entire $90,000 that had been spent at the recording studio. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's where it, that's where it died as something that could be released during the uh, 20th century by yeah. another record company. Nobody was willing to pick up the uh, $90,000 in there. I, I guess I learned a lot about my lack of celebrity pull during the uh, Mondo 2000 uh, era uh, when I tried to uh, get 
Stone and Rolling Stone and telling the story, uh, just like, nah, nobody cares. Oh. <laughs> records ever did get co- told and there are there are some other people who uh, who uh, were upset that uh, their stuff never got released yeah. I remember talking with one of them I don't re- I mean they did they put everything behind Marilyn Manson I guess which was a definitely a good decision financially and you know I, I actually thought the albums were, were good too uh, mm-hmm. but uh, we all know, we all know oh, where, yeah. uh, where where Mr. Manson is <laughs> It wound up in in the uh, in the uh, gallery yeah. of ultra grotesque. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that's kind of a funny thought too that I had. Um, you know, talking about Mondo Vanilli and the album, and there's like a in my mind that alternative uh, thread reality where the I O U Baby gets released on Nothing Records, and I, I think it's like it it has the trajectory of Marilyn Manson. <laughs> and then like and then like like now i'm talking to marilyn manson talking about his album not getting made and then you like friends with uh kanye right now going to his church or something <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Could, have, could have married uh what's her name oh my goodness yeah rose mcgallon <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can... <laughs> marilyn manson all right no i'm not getting into it um <laughs> i mean really you... anyway so uh, been a guru, huh? <laughs> yeah. it's a bit much. Um, yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah. So they went with uh, where they went with Marilyn, and uh, gained uh, certainly they gained some uh, financial reward from uh, from his album. I guess Antichrist Superstar was probably the one he was uh, he was working on at the time. Okay. Yeah, because um, and also too, I think too part of. Well, from my perspective of the concept of Amando Vanilli is to kind of like break those genre specific things in in the sense where you could market Marilyn Manson, even, the, you know, they're great albums, but they're also to, you know, always within his like genre. And, yeah. 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 I mean, we I remember a uh, discussion with uh, Scrappy, you know, about the. Uh, how we admired uh, Trent Reznor as a musician, mm-hmm. but to us, all his albums sound pretty much the same, yeah. even now. And uh, how I, how we think he would he could probably make a really great acoustic album. He could probably make an album of folk songs that would be yeah. pop songs that would be really really good. You know, maybe maybe someday. I don't know if uh, Marilyn ha- has that in him, but you never know. Yeah, so I mean, we we were definitely not into being pinned down to uh, one specific sound or, or style of music. And I think I, you know, we 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 just did uh, Scrappy and I just did uh, I'm against NFTs. Oh yeah, uh, which is in the genre of pop music basically, mm-hmm. um, with the great punk singer Blog Dolly on on vocals. Um, maybe I hope we're going to get to do a lot, a lot more stuff and a lot of different styles. Mm-hmm. Now, I remember I had a discussion with Jonathan Burnside about how we both really admired the Beatles' White Album because they took up every every genre that was uh, hanging around at that time, and they picked it up and turned it over and and uh, did something marvelous with it. Yeah, yeah. And I do like, you know, I do feel like some of the newer stuff too is similar in in the sense of uh, not not a book but a feature, and all of that stuff is this kind of um, exploring of what 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 is uh, going on now, uh, mm-hmm. in in the same vein of which what you were exploring, what what was like that going on then, to like maybe extremes or the edges. To find out, or or maybe to tap into some of the the future threads that are maybe dominant now in in, in our culture. Um, yeah, playing with virtual reality, even virtual reality as like alter egos, avatars. Like almost everybody now has an avatar or, or alter ego. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think the stuff I do now is pretty pretty on on the zeitgeist. Mm-hmm. Does. I mean, people are going to hear about it or listen to it or uh, 
or respond to it that way. Of course, we did a video for Gun Serial, which was the old Mondo Vanilli song from 1993, which is, you know, wake up and kill. Yeah. Uh, pretty much, and that was a Sim 1 thing. That was her, her contribution. She uh, is one of the uh, two songs, two recordings that she had a heavy hand in, including the title. So all credit is due, uh, but that, I mean, that's, that's pretty precisely on the zeitgeist right now. People uh, shooting up crowds every day or... Uh, and even or, more extreme of how random it seems of where this one kid was just shooting down the street. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. yeah. Just, uh, the people who are the people who uh, shoot people who enter their per- personal yeah, uh, supplies. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's getting more lunatic all the time. I hope we get to make some more music before uh, uh, it becomes impossible. Uh, <laughs> and- one thing about IOU, babe, um, that I've been that I was thinking about was uh, lyrically, it was it, it's a very peculiar reaction. A lot of the lyrics are a peculiar reaction that I had at that time to being in relationships with, or in some cases, just hanging out with uh, sex workers. Mm, okay. um, and if you look at the lyrics, that's, there's, there's a lot of that in there. And it, it's not necessarily kind. It's me working through my own shit in some ways. And it's, it's, a, uh, it's a mix of identifying with that and of, uh, of having jealousy uh, from being in rela- open relation, being in an open relationships with people who are prettier than you, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is, which is uh, in some ways being dealt a losing hand. <laughs> uh, and, and there are there are a lot of uh, these peculiar currents running through that album that mm-hmm. uh, you probably wouldn't probably wouldn't think about making it today. Uh-huh. I mean, I have a batch of really politically incorrect lyrics that yeah. I've pushed to the side. Uh, I, I probably get them recorded on demand if somebody really wanted them. And I, I, I was thinking, I, I, I wrote this particular song that was trying to conjure the uh, lyrics, the, the title right now, Damn. Yeah, probably come back. I was trying to write something in the... I was, trying to, I was kind of thinking of... Uh, songs on this year's model by Elvis Costello. I thought, okay, I'm going to write a misogynist song in Uh the style of Elvis Costello. Although Elvis would deny that some of those songs are are actually profoundly feminist, like this year's model, Uh, but that they're mixed. Mm -hmm. Um, And I decided that, oh yeah, the the title of the song is Sugar and Spite and Everything Trite. (laughs) And uh, so I, I wrote this song. And I put the lyrics aside and I said, okay, I'm never going to use this or share it or have it recorded. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then I decided that if I called the girl in the song Karen, mm-hmm. everybody would like it. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's something to chew on. <laughs> That's kind of uh, interesting, too, of like where we are now and like versus where it was when you were doing Mondo Vanilli. Yeah. And um, also, too, you know, like something like Gun Serial doing that now, how would you would it be different or would would you still? Oh, yeah, the, the sort of growly, uh, you're sweet like a rose and I love your new, t- your new clothes. Would I do that now? May- yeah, yeah, maybe. I mean, I don't think that's too, too harsh. I think I might try to make my... Vocals sound a little less macho, but I don't <laughs> yeah. know. That one's too rough. And also, too, you know, like, I think what has happened or what is part of the thing, and I, I feel it in my own self of, you know, but, you know, I, I remember, I think also to why I connect with you is, like, uh, I, I grew up, like, in the East LA punk scene, so I like, like, punk stuff, and I always have, like, this punk attitude. So even reading when, kind of speculating, like, maybe uh, Trent Reznor didn't really get it, I was like, oh, that's kind of like punk, like, you know, writing, creating an album that was like too, too extreme or too um, out there for Trent Reznor, you know? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. yeah. As it was. Yeah. yeah. It, was, it was too out there by not, by not being in the genre. Yeah. And what uh, 
Well, Reznor and his uh, record company, <clears throat> actually, the, his management was very skeptical of sending Mondo Vanilli into the recording studio uh -huh. as a non-touring band based on the cassette tape that we had left with Reznor at the, uh, at the Sharon Tate house. And they put up a, a sum of money, I think it might have been $10,000, uh, for us to go into the studio and make the first few songs. And what we did was we made Gimme Helter, mm -hmm. and we made The Medium Is The Message, and we made a really sort of uh, fast, banging version of Thanks, and uh, they loved all of that. Then when we got into the studio, we kind of subverted the... Yeah. Uh, the uh, impression that we were sticking reasonably close to elect to to uh, hard electronica genres. Now, I think particularly sliding a uh, piece of that of uh, super mellow elevator music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, clones don't have to be so cold. It's a wonderful, wonderful piece actually. And I O U Babe is sort of this weird ass country, almost like a country yeah. song with a horse galloping through it. Like a Johnny, an attempt, my attempt at Johnny Cash style vocals. <laughs> but yeah, I like the 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 range, I, I guess. And and you know, I think this is something too. It's a it's a mixed bag now. Like there is a lot of blending of, mm -hmm. of genres. I mean, almost everything now is like three different yeah. things combined together. But then there's also this kind of like I think where where we'll get to and kind of and end around of what we kind of touched on in the beginning, the AI and language models and like this kind of like mediocrity that the language models <laughs> turn everything into. Yeah. Even you, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah but that's, uh, and that's what people are, are buying. Yeah. You know, uh, I mean, the, the American idolization of popular music is relatively complete. I think rock mm -hmm. and roll, real, real rock has kind of disappeared. I don't know. Yeah. Well, anybody who uh, appears in the gra on the Grammys, for instance, that uh, I mean, I, I, Marilyn Manson might have been the goodbye, the goodbye kiss off, you know, <laughs> in some ways, an appropriate, an appropriate closing act, I suppose. Yeah. But who knows? I mean, I mean, there are people doing good stuff. It's just you know they're not at the top of the of the pops. That you know, that's that's kind of like an interesting thing of. I think you you playing around with virtual reality, but also to this kind of um, reality TV when you're talking about like uh, American idolization of things. Because I remember I was in high school when when the first season of American Idol, and I'm a I'm a punk kid that that thinks anybody who gets signed to a major record label is lame and and sellouts, and I don't want to listen to them anymore. <laughs> and and so I go American Idol, like fuck that, like that's not like. Who would want to like uh, like that's not how like a band gets made you know <laughs> like in my head and I'm like that's not gonna last and then here we are now still like going and I'm just like this yeah. kind of uh, well yeah. now now there's an MTV uh, show in which people compete at doing uh, avant-garde types of art oh my god <laughs> <laughs> which, I mean in some ways is what the art world is uh -huh. actually i mean it's uh, actually brings it down to its uh brings yeah. it down to its basics you know no no pretenses that i mean there were you know there were there wasn't anybody doing uh anything at the level of you know having themselves shot in the hand or or nailed to a volkswagen or you know <laughs> yeah. uh, you know that that level of uh performance theater um, it was all it was all relatively contained. I mean, what was interesting was that the uh, tropes were all in this uh, very uh, what would you call it? Uh, I don't like using the word woke, but it was, they were all in in the vein of oh, in, and this piece uh, you'll comment on the colonialism of. Mm such or you know you know, uh, yeah. it, it all had this uh you know in, in this mtv art contest it had all the uh, tropes of the social justice, justice. Yeah. Wow. in some ways the cliches of social justice woven into it and everybody jumped right in and you know that people obviously had their stories to tell um most of them were not 
white straight men when they had legitimate stories to tell. But I mean, it's this interesting uh, intersection, and it, the word intersection jumped into my mind uh, unplanned, but. <laughs> uh, It's an interesting intersection between uh, what you might call intersectionalism and corporatism. Now, that uh, is difficult to examine because of all the sensitivities around. But you know, I mean, what can what can we really say? I mean, uh, yeah, I, I think too. You know, um, I noticed I had this talk with some of my friends, like people a little bit y younger than me. I'm I'm 38, and yeah. how how they're so, um, like, branding, it comes to them kind of, like, naturally, organically. Like, they're, they're not, they're, they're, they're like, oh, I need to, like, brand myself or this and that. And, like, I, for me, like, I like, oh, branding or even, like, promoting myself, I, I find that kind of, like, lame in my old, my old punk uh, mentality. But also, too, I remember I was in this, like, crypto thing, and they were talking about, oh, um, what we need is, is not more research or branding and they're talking about like branding and, and communicating the concepts and i'm like yeah that that's true but also too there's something like i don't think it's the uh, branding exercise that needs to happen like better marketing for for these ideas but i think that might be the thing that's souring things and and for me it's kind of like more about like the poetics of it <laughs> and like and like kind of going into like i think what you're writing about recently was about being more of you that like an that an ai can't like recreate that can't, right. that right. can't make a copy of because it's always kind of like within the zeitgeist of like what you're bringing all of yourself into this moment within the, yeah. the context of this moment too well i mean mondo vanilli was of course completely playing with branding yeah uh, and, the, and uh One of our raps was that we were going to be the first Dadaist multinational corporation. Yeah. And we're ending to the a point of, uh, of obscenity. Yeah. And very importantly, to uh, have no rules and be, and be absolutely random about it as part of, as part of that. And that's where the, uh, the originality comes in. Mm -hmm. There was a very active Mondo Vanilli uh, topic in the uh, bulletin board, The Well, pre-social mm -hmm. media, in which what Mondo Vanilli was, was something like all kinds of people participated in, in an utterly random, silly, playful, funny, nonsensical way. There was, there was no attempt to uh, rein anything in or have anybody uh, do anything that reflects on the band that was also calling itself Mondo Manili. And there was the, the idea that we could uh, let other groups and other projects also call themselves Mondo Manili. So it could be distributed. So it was like this, uh, on the one hand, this sort of random uh, democratization and this wild sort of branding, uh, you know, creating uh, various arms and legs of the Mondo mm -hmm. Manili monster. But that kind of comes later on, kind of like, um, you know, social media guerrilla marketing becomes like part of just like this staple that people do. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. yeah guerrilla marketing is uh, something that corporations have taken up. I mean, yeah. I, I, I mean, the word disruption actually comes from the radical left. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's, you know, uh, things take take a, take a lot of uh a lot of strange turns yeah. along, along the road to uh, wherever it is uh, we've ended up. Um, I, I guess wrapping things up and going to what what you're doing now, also too with with the con of I guess like you know continuing on this concept and this thread of Mondo Vanilli, but also to what you're doing with um, are you against NFTs? And I, I think um, soon there's going to be another like a event where they're using um are are you cyber yeah there's another thing going on at something called hack stock yeah hack stock. there we go and i think uh, uh i'm against nfts is going to have some kind of a role in that and there's a uh, space that was built for previous event i can't remember the name of it but uh you captured the yeah the, 
the Mo- Mozfest. Right, Mozfest, and that that space still exists. Yeah, somewhere, <laughs> and it will be reused and amplified amplified upon. It's a you know a space that you can move around in with uh, goggles, with uh, with a headset or without a without a headset. So playing in virtual reality finally after uh, <laughs> all all this time, and you know it's great. Sure, bring it on. Bring it on. That's, Maybe I'll get an AI version of uh, myself. Yeah. <laughs> somewhere, somehow. I mean, it's interesting to me, the people who object to using tools that uh-huh. happen to be put out by evil people or, or, yeah. or you know, bad, bad. And to me, use play with the shit. Yeah. Obviously, remain, remain in play, you know, remain critical take the piss out of it but uh play with play with what what you what you have and you know mondo vanilla mondo 2000 postmodernism uh, every every reference that uh, we had in in what we were doing mm-hmm. was about uh, the culture of appropriation and, and remixing mm-hmm. culture and the current chatbots and uh, ai's are a massive cauldron of uh, culture available for remixing, and people should uh, be aware of it and be concerned about people being ripped off by it. But they should also consider the field of play at the same time. Yeah, and I, I think to to echo or piggyback on your point, playing with it gets you more aware of it, <laughs> and yeah. to, to where you kind of. Intuitive sense, like, wait, is this the AI writing? This isn't. This is a. This is AI writing. This shit, <laughs> because yeah, yeah. there's a, a certain like template or t- a thing that you kind of pick up on. I think, um, yeah, especially with the images to, too. But you also learn how how good it might be getting. Yeah, so it's, yeah. So it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it's important to know what you're talking about, right? I yeah, mean, totally. uh, I know, you know, Frank Zappa hated drugs, but he said he tried every one of them twice. So that he would know what he was talking about. <laughs> no, why you, you hate that drug? <laughs> and, the, and the same thing is like the, the l- large language models, and uh, I kind of like the the framing, or or I like to play with it a lot. That you know, the internet is like um, LSD, and then like these uh, this new form of of using it with the light, large language models. Cause, okay, if that if that was LSD, this might be like DMT. <laughs> <laughs> And, and I think it's kind of funny too that they use the word that oh, uh, Bing was uh, prone to hallucinations, and I'm just like, yeah. I don't, that is, I don't, that really that's wild. hilarious. Like, yeah, we yeah. need we need some quantum uh, psychology uh, and maybe logic with <laughs> strongly yeah. in our culture. But that's why I I, I love uh, your work and uh, I have fun uh, playing around with with your music and your ideas. Um, so yeah. Happy else? Any last thoughts? Um, Keep in touch. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for your time. Have a good good time. Bye. Bye. Bye.